A warm good afternoon to each one of you. Of course, coming up on the marketplace, Ghana is to gain $25.3 billion from non-traditional exports by 2029. Of course, also coming up, massive job scam hits the trade ministry amid COVID-19 and aid distribution. We shall be giving you details on all these stories and more after this break. Hello and welcome. I'm Charles Aite. Now, for the past weeks, we have been talking about a national export development strategy that will change the face of Ghana's non-traditional exports. Now, this strategy document, which targets to attract about $25.3 billion from non-traditional exports by 2029, seeks to vigorously promote and support Ghanaian majority-owned manufacturing companies to undertake various processing in Ghana and forward integration towards the selling of liquefied various you know various liquefied products as, as well as chocolate mass or manufacturing of chocolate in the consumer market in the country now joining us for more on this is the director of the project for the ghana export promotion authority he's in the person of alex dajawa we're so grateful sir that you joined us so first of all what exactly are you aiming to target under the non-traditional exports by 2029 well Thank you very much for having me, and uh, good afternoon to your listeners. As you rightly said, the National Export Development Strategy, a uh, document that has been prepared um, with, by Ghana Export Promotion Authority, working with stakeholders throughout the country and under the aegis of the Ministry of Trade and Industry, uh, has an ultimate objective of raking re in $25.3 billion of non-traditional exports by 2029. Looking at the current figures of $2.9 billion that we have, we think that that is not enough. Ghana has more potential than we are doing now. And, um, you know, we export a lot of products uh, from Ghana. So there is a need to prioritize the products uh, to see which ones, you know, give us the best uh, prospect of generating that um, uh, quite uh, ambitious targets by uh, 2029. And so a number of products have been prioritized, uh, which have been uh, carefully selected and uh, listed in the strategy document for implementation uh, from 2021. It's interesting, uh, it's interesting you stated. Uh, it's interesting you stated that it is an ambitious project, but how do you meet this target? Well, the, the strategy outlines three main uh, pillars on which the strategy uh, rests. The first one has to do with the supply capacity of the products that we have currently. We have recognized that Ghana really does not have um, the capacity in terms of production to be able to meet the growing uh, demand of the quality Ghanaian products that we have uh, in the international market. So. The strategy, you know, outlines various strategies and interventions aimed at boosting our raw material supply. That ties in with government's own um, agenda of industrializing uh, our um, economy, as it were. So the products that we have targeted will be given a lot of boost in order to increase their uh, production that will feed the industries that are coming up, particularly under the one district, one um, uh, uh, industry uh, project of government. Industry one factor. Well, so Alex, products, we are dealing with uh, mainly uh, products in the horticultural sector, but beyond that, also we are looking at transforming the the products into industrial products. For example, we are targeting um, cocoa products, uh, even to the extent of chocolates, because that is where we know uh, we fetch the money. So if we are doing under $1 billion currently of um, processed cocoa, i.e. mainly in the form of powder and butter. If we finish the, these products in Ghana by way of, you know, producing chocolate, which some of our, our factories are already doing, for example, Niche Cocoa is doing marvelously well in uh, production of chocolate. We expect that this will give us a lot more resources uh, in terms of foreign revenue going uh, forward. Mm. We're also looking at cashew. Great. But, you know, let's, let's, take them, let's take them one after the other, Alex. You're talking about cocoa. And it's interesting, um, I have read the document for myself, and there is a part mm. where you're talking about local taxes that the strategy hopes to waive off. 
in order to make yeah. local, co local consumption much more deepened. If you could walk us through yeah. this specific tax and how much of a detriment it has been in making you know, cocoa consumption much more attractive. Well, you know, currently, um, that again you know, brings us to the second pillar of the strategy, which is the regulatory environment that gives incentives for Ghanaian producers, particularly manufacturers, to be able to be competitive on the, inter 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 the international market. As it is now, we know that various you know, taxes that are imposed uh, on uh, production, which we think that if we, we are targeting the export market, these taxes would have to be removed in order to make the production of these tertiary products more competitive. That will also enable even local consumption. Because when we are dealing with the economy, it's not only export, but also domestic uh, you know, consumption and production, which is also very important. And so it's a two-tier approach that we are going to utilize as you know, uh, outlined in the strategy document. Great. And these you know just, just before we end, Alex, one interesting non-traditional export which is gaining ground is that of coconut. And if our producers could pull this particular projection that we have from the document mm. app, that tells us where we should be expecting coconut exports in the near future. We shall be getting that particular projection on our screen shortly. But the prospects of coconut, how much of a bright future do we have, especially when it's currently subsistent? Of course, you could see on, on your screen there, you're hoping to rake in close to 298 million US dollars from coconut yeah. by 2029. How are you going to transform yeah. this niche market? Well, it all has to do again with the supply capacity that I mentioned earlier on, uh, because coconut is a very important um, uh, you know, uh, crop now in the international markets uh, because of its natural nature and the fact that people are conscious of their health. So many more countries are you know, looking for natural products such as coconut um, by way of even the um, coconut water and also transforming the coconut itself into other tertiary products like the oil, which is in high demand. But if you look at uh, the production right now, it's at a very low st uh, state now, uh, mainly because of the challenges with production, i.e. The, the, the disease that has affected the coconut production for some time now. And so because of that, Ghana Export Promotion Authority itself right now is assisting you know, growers and producers of coconut with seedlings, with hybrid seedlings that are resistant to diseases. And uh, these are supposed to go to the farmers directly for cultivation. And we are looking at, um, you know, distributing close to 5 million, 10 million, you know, seedlings uh, going forward. And this will boost production. And once production is, you know, boosted, there are a number of uh, companies that are now setting up uh, to produce coconut oil and other products from coconut. Okay. And these are estimated to give us a lot more foreign exchange uh, in the 10-year period that we are targeting. Alex, we're so grateful that you joined us. We shall be keeping an eye on your strategy document to see how best the non-traditional export transforms by 2029. Away from that, more than 10,000 farmers in cocoa growing communities are benefited from a special initiative to support them and enhance their production. Now, the project being spearheaded by the Amen Femam Rural Bank is meant to enhance the yield of cocoa farmers to meet Ghana's ambitious annual production target of 1 million tons. The CEO, Dr. Alex Asma, spoke to my colleague Prince Apia at the bank's 36th annual general meeting in Wasa of the Western North region. Here's more. The 36th annual general meeting of the Memphima Rural Bank was held in Wase Kopon in the Western North region. The bank posted a 42% growth in profit after tax. Deposits increased from 189 million cities to 254 million cities in 2019, whilst assets increased by 36.5%. CEO Dr. Alex Asma says, the trend shows confidence in the bank despite financial and pandemic challenges. 
the year 2019, in spite of the difficulties coming from the uh, banking reforms, we were still able to grow at 42% on profitability. And um, the bank also grew in all aspects of its business, deposit mobilization, total asset investment, everything pointed uh, to the positive. And Ghana's annual cocoa production target of 1 million tons have been missed for over five years now. As part of initiatives to support farmers to enhance their production, Amefimon Rural Bank, through its special farmers loan program, has invested over 30 million cities in cocoa farmers. Dr. Alex Asma again. Uh, largely, a lot of financial institutions think that farmers are very risky because especially uh, a lot of the farmers are doing what we call small older farms and they are undocumented. But look, the farmers are the ones that are holding this economy together. Uh, cocoa farmers in particular drive a lot of economic activities in our communities where we operate. So I'm a very rural bank last year uh, invested quite a lot in the farmers that we are able to bring the farmers together in cooperatives in small groups and then we educate and train them financially and we're able to give money to them 10,000 individual farmers benefited from this project 32 million Ghana cities were given out to these farmers as, as loans that we give them a long moratorium up to some up to six months some up to seven months for them to work on their farms on until their produce uh, uh, are out before they start paying them. Meanwhile, about 2.3 million CDs was invested in the CSR project, which includes supporting the construction of a Dadia So Chips compound and a laundry facility at the Wasa Government Hospital. Managing Director for ARB Apex Bank, Kujomata, has therefore implored communities in bank operating areas. So I want to encourage our customers to continue doing business with us, continue doing business with a rural bank in your community, because when we make profits, the profits are reinvested in the communities in which we operate. Board Chairman Dr. Tony Orban says the growth of the bank was supported by aggressive deposit mobilization strategy, Prince Apia reporting. Now, telecoms giant MTN has said that it has been, it has been given the nod by its shareholders to buy back its excess of one million shares of applicants who did not provide sufficient personal information to complete their Know Your Customer requirements as required under the company's initial public offer. According to the chief executive of MTN Ghana, Salama Dadevo, his outfits will proceed to return a cash approximately of 860,000 cities to the set shareholders. He spoke at the virtual extraordinary general meeting of the Scansom PLC that's MTN Ghana organized this morning at the MTN house. That we've been able to get this across the line and there are several Ghanaians who purchased shares and haven't had the opportunity to participate because of the incomplete KYC. So the objective now is to return the cash to them, including the dividends they've accrued, just to be fair. And, and hopefully some of them will see the announcement and update their KYC before the process begins shortly. So how much are we talking about here in, in, excess, in total of how much? It's about a million customers mm -hmm. at 75 plus dividends, which is approximately 860,000 Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. right. So what's the next step? Uh, when next should we expect maybe an announcement from MTN? Yeah, so we'll have the announcement with a buyback. will be next week. We're working currently with the Security and Exchange Commission. Mm -hmm. To complete the process but there'll be an announcement in the papers and it will continue from there you also mentioned that you are, you look at uh earmarking some amount of funds to support covid 19 fights can you shed more light on this sure so next year is our 25th anniversary and we thought as part of this we should dedicate some funds into a specific fund related to the covid 19 recovery so we've committed 25 million dollars which is approximately 150 million ghana cities and we'll be working with governments to define a set of projects looking at digital inclusion, looking at digital expansion, all in our bid to become a digital economy in the coming years. Now, the Ministry of Trade and Industry has issued a public alert against job scams. Fraudsters are currently preying on gullible and desperate job seekers eyeing to work at the ministry. 
Let's pull up the public notice it released minutes ago. Of course, as you could see on your screens, is headlined fake requests for applicants for government COVID-19 economic stimulus package, the Ministry of Trade and Industry Entrepreneurship Funding Program. Now, the attention of the Ministry of Trade and Industry has been drawn to a fraudulent URL page. You could see the link to that particular page requesting individuals and businesses to submit an online application for a government COVID-19 economic stimulus package. The ministry wishes to caution the general public that the website and the request for applicants is completely fraudulent. The ministry is not administering any such funding program in court. Neither has the ministry published any official notice as reported by the fraudsters. It was signed by the chief director Patrick Yao Nimo there. To help us understand how endemic this issue is, is a public relations officer of the trade ministry, Prince Boache. He joins us via the phone. Prince so grateful that you joined us. Now, these are desperate times for job seekers and fosters as well. How are you dealing with the issue beyond this public alert that you just issued? Thank you, my brother, Charles. And I'm very much grateful to yourself and to Joy and for that matter, Multimedia for taking this issue up. And that is why we continue to work in partnership. And we are very grateful for the partnership. We cannot uh, handle this issue alone. And it is for that reason that your support is very much needed in this. And with such a bigger platform as yours and putting the whole notice out, I'm sure people are listening to you. We circulated it to other media outlets as well. And we are pleading with Ghanaians and any other person not to fall victim to this. There is nothing as government COVID-19 economic stimulus package with the so-called website as uh, quoted. There's nothing like that. And so I would even, and I'm, I'm very happy that you didn't even put it out there to give uh, credence to it. And I would even also want to uh, amplify that. All we want to see is that there's nothing of that sort. Whatever stimulus package government is giving to Ghanaians and for that matter businesses has been well articulated. Any support to small and medium scale uh, businesses and individuals, the National Board for Small Scale Industries, NDSSI, is there. And everybody knows that they are administering it. The Ministry of Trade and Industry is a policy making body and not an operational, uh, operational unit. Mm. And we are not administering anything of that nature. And everybody will discount it. Prince, we're so grateful for this information and of course you, we hope that this, this information sinks down well with each and every prospective worker out there, job seeker out there. You're still watching the marketplace. Let's take a short break. We'll be back with more stories. Just stay. You're welcome to the program. Now, of course, whenever we're talking of COVID-19, one group of people that feel the pinch are that of start -uppers. and in all these, have we had a startup bill being, you know, constituted to help address the specific needs of startups moving forward? We're going to be having much more of a sensitization workshop on this, and to help us understand the remit proper, is Solomon Ajay, the founder of the Ghana Startup Network and communications director for the Ghana Startup Bill Technical Working Committee. Solomon, we're so grateful that you joined us. Thank you for how timely? Me. How mm. timely is this whole bill amid COVID-19? Well, so first and foremost, let me thank you and your team and everyone watching us at the moment. Um, it's very timely that we look at um, what startups go through at the moment. COVID has affected every business. Exactly. Um, we are the most affected startups going down and down and down. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the research shows that we provide much jobs to you know, the, the population, we more than the government and other things. Sure. You know, but as, as we speak now, most companies have gone down. You know, you, you're able to employ us, you used to employ, you're able to sell out, you used to sell, you're able to put us, you used to produce. So it affected us massively. And so we think that it's a time that we need to get certain incentive that we need as people to put ourselves, you know, in place. So government will have to support us as startups. But we already have some incentives on board from the National Board for Small Scale Industries and even that of the Trade Ministry as well. Yeah, so the art or the bill, I should say, is, and I understand it's supposed to be a bill for the art. The focus is not just on COVID-19. Okay. They're just, COVID is just a person's phase of it. Exactly. But we're looking at a permanent thing that, I mean, for generations yet unborn. All right, so the focus is to legitimize certain, certain things. For, for instance, what is happening now with the MBSI support for startups? Exactly. Can we get a, a way to make it legitimized so that every startup can apply for it with or without COVID-19? Mm. Okay, can startups just apply for kind of capacity building workshops? 
can instead of just apply for, let's say, funding, mm. let's say, uh, want to travel for exposure, can you instead of have that kind of support to trade beyond the borders of Ghana? Can you of have some kind of, um, let's say, human resource capacity, like government employing one or two people to help you, you know, produce more than you're supposed to produce alone? You know, so the, the bill is looking beyond just um, COVID-19. It's a broad thing that is going to, when implemented or when passed by parliament, is going to, to more and more of create an incentive framework, you know, for, to, to, to support startups, you know, in the, in the, in the right. long run. So we do know it is in the initial stages, and for that you're going to be having a sensitization workshop. What should prospects be in terms of our expectations in the future for this workshop? Well, so we, we as part of our mandate as a committee, we are supposed to engage every stakeholder in the system. Mm. This is a bill that has been worked on by us and for us. You know, so what the key point is for us to engage everybody, get the views of everybody who matters on it. Over the time, we've engaged a series of people. The last two weeks, for instance, we were doing for oh, three days mm. for a retreat, where we invited certain agencies and institutions whose voice matters come to business operations in Ghana, like the ROGD, like the FDA, and all those kind of people. So they came on board to review what we've done at the draft, made their input, and then that was great for us. The next thing we are is to engage the end user beneficiaries mm. of the art. When the art is part, who would it benefit? The startups, the young entrepreneurs. So now that we have got a draft, can we present to them, this is what we have for you. What are your input into it? So the workshop that's happening tomorrow is basically to present the draft bill to the young entrepreneurs and the startups who are the beneficiaries. So now say, make your input into it. So it's got to look at all the areas of it in terms of the, what startup really is. And that's one funny word, the startup, who is a startup? Mm. That's one key word that had been, I mean, we could sit on it the whole day discussing startup. <laughs> in all the workshops that we've had, every, every, every time we go on, we have to spend like at least one, two, three, four hours. Determining discuss. what a startup is. That alone. <laughs> you know, because people need to, is it, is it just about the age of business mm. or the age of the person running the business? Or is it about employment level? or about revenue level. Okay. So all those things need to be determined. We need to determine who a startup really is. And then we look at what benefit can you get at a startup. Sure, sure. All right, so that, that clearly you know, defines in terms of access to fund, uh, funding, uh, access to markets, right. mentorships, those kind of things. I could imagine how yeah. much of a, it's, it's uh, crazy, a man. use this is going to be for yeah. the startups across the country. We're so good for Solomon. Mm. We shall be following this workshop closely to you know, update uh, entrepreneurs out there, prospective viewers out there, hoping to tap into this whole initiative. We're so grateful. That's right. That's right. Thank course, you for having me. Thank you very much as well. Solomon, here's the founder of the Ghana Startup Network and communications director for the Ghana Startup Bill Technical Working Committee. Of course, this has been The Marketplace. My name is Charles. I'll take